We are now live, sir. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning and welcome everyone to our online conference on awareness and prevention of cervical cancer. I am Dr. Rajesh Kesri. I would be taking you through this conference. I'd like to start uh, this meeting and this conference with a shloka written by the very famous author of Mahabharata, Maharshi Vedvyas. It goes like this. Nasti matra sama chaya, nasti matra sama gati, nasti matra samam tran, nasti matra sama priya. Which means that there's no shade like mothers, there's no support like mothers, there's no savior like mothers, and there's no like that of mothers. So we understand the very important of mothers. We understand the importance of uh, them in our life and how important their life is to all of us. But when their life comes in a shadow of disease like cancer, cancer has been aptly termed as emperor of all maladies, and now it is affecting more and more individuals. Today we are going to talk and discuss about a cancer which affects only the female gender, that is the cervical cancer. Now, the cervical cancer is a form of cancer that affects the cells of the cervix, that is the lower part of the uterus. And the reason of this cancer is a virus. A virus are very being becoming very popular now. More and more people are now getting to understand the importance of virus. And this virus is called human papilloma virus. This virus infects the cervix the female reproductive, the, the organ of the female, and it lives there for years. And in some individuals, not all females, in some of them, it may cause uh, the cells of the cervix to turn cancerous, ultimately leading to cancer. And this cancer in its initial stages causes no symptoms, no discomfort. And later on, as it progresses, it may cause some symptoms like bleeding, which may be identical to some other problems which females usually generally have. So at times they don't uh, pay much attention to that, to that. But then this cancer progresses and ultimately it may uh, become the cause of uh, their mortality, their, uh, their uh, untimely death. So this is the very importance of the Cervical Cancer Awareness Month. January is celebrated as the Cervical Cancer uh, uh, Awareness Month to prevent this awareness about, uh, about cervical cancer among our population and among all, uh, among all the females. So this is uh, the reason behind which, uh, this is the reason behind the organization of this conference about disseminating, disseminating knowledge on what is being done all over the world and especially in our country with the help of professionals, professional organizations about uh, spreading information and uh, prevention of cervical cancer. It forms about 16.5% of total cancer cases in Indian women. It is second most common type of cancer among uh, the women in our country, second only to the breast cancer. And it is estimated that about 160 million women between ages of 30 and 59 years are at a very high risk for developing this cancer. So there's going to be a lot of discussion about cervical cancer, about how to prevent. So I won't come between you and a galaxy of speakers which are going to enlighten us. And uh, all our panelists are uh, very well known, not only in our country, all over the world. Uh, and they would be enlightening us about the efforts which are being done all over the world and in the country to prevent and, in fact, to eliminate cervical cancer. Now, this program is being organized by SOHM. SOHM is an organization which has always been at the forefront for a century now, taking up many public initiatives in creating health awareness, 
creating awareness about social environmental issues, taking them out to the public, and they have touched millions and millions of life now for the benefit of uh, the whole of the society in our country, not just the industry. This program is being supported by TCI, Renew Park, Condom Alliance, uh, and of course, uh, I would like to mention, especially with uh, uh, BD, uh, which is, as we all know, a worldwide leader in women's health care and cervical cancer solutions globally. And India, BD has contributed immensely to cervical cancer space over the last several years. That includes developing and making available affordable liquid-based cytology solutions in India, and also driven focus interventions on supporting awareness, system strengthening, and capacity building. This program is also supported by Roche, which is the world's largest biotech uh, company, Roche Diagnostics India, established in the year 2002, has a broad range of innovative diagnostic tests and systems. I'm so thankful to all of you for joining. I am so thankful to the audience, which has taken out time and joined us. Now, carrying the program forward, I'd like to uh, invite Mr. Ravi Bhatnagar, who's the co-chairperson, SOCM CSR Council, and Director, External Affairs and Partnerships, South of Asia, on from Reckitt. So, Mr. Bhatnagar, I'd like to invite you to uh, welcome our panelist. Thank you so much, Dr. Rajesh. Uh, so, good morning, all. Uh, it's very, very important, like, you know, this uh, month, uh, this whole awareness month for January 2022, where we are doing this conference on awareness and the prevention of survival ca cervical cancer. So, first of all, uh, good morning to everyone and uh, I heartily welcome, you know, all the esteemed, uh, you know, people who have joined us. And special uh, thanks to Madam Priyanka Chaturvedi, Honorable Member of Parliament, Rajya Sabha, Dr. Princess Nono, uh, Assistant Director General and Special Advisor for the Strategic Priorities, WHO, Dr. Shalini Singh, Director ICMR, uh, Dr. S. Shanta Kumari, President Foxy, Dr. Ra Radhika Srinivasan, Professor and Head of the Department of Cytology and Gynecology, Gynecology Pathology at uh, PGIM at Chandigarh, uh, Mr. Narendra Varde, Managing Director, India and Neighboring Markets, Roche Diagnostics, Dr. Abhishek Shankar, Associate Professor, Department of Radiation Oncology, Ames, Patna, uh, Ms. Mridu, Mridu Gupta, Chief Executive Officer, Cancer Awareness Prevention and Early Detection Trust and learned audience and colleagues. I welcome you all on behalf of SHM. The Survival Health Awareness Month is observed in January every year to highlight its effects of survival cancer and uh, its prevention measures. It substantially helps to initiate highly significant measures to prevent uh, cervical cancer and eventually to promote women's health holistically. Uh, Cervical cancer is the fourth most common cancer in women around the world, with a half a million new cases, about 300,000 deaths annually, despite large preventable solutions available. Cervical cancer is both uh, uh, preventable and treatable, as there are effective screening methods to detect women who are likely to develop cancer in the future, as at an early stage. Cervical cancer, if detected early, then it can be cured and better treatment by the prevention by vaccination that protects against uh, the virus. Uh, delays in the diagnostics and treatments of the survival, cervical cancer are the main reasons for the high uh, cancer uh, you know, death rates. The World Health Organization aims to eliminate cervical cancer by 2030, for which 90% of the girls must be fully vaccinated with the HPV a vaccine by the age of 15. 70% of the women screened by the age of 35 and again by the age of 45, among several other measures to be adapted. Government of India is also focusing on the priority for prevention, control, screening, and timely treatment of cervical cancer, including oral and breast cancer, as well as to improve the women's health. On behalf of SHM, I request to all partners, patrons, and stakeholders to support our Government of India on the cervical cancer to make uh, on the cervical cancer uh, movement, we should focus on the awareness, vaccination, screening, and treatment to eliminate the disease. With these closing words, I request Dr. Rajesh Kesriji to continue the session. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, 
Ravi Bhattacharya ji for the very nice introduction of all our speakers and our panelists. Now to carry forward the session, I would uh, invite uh, Dr. Radhika Srinivasan, Professor and Head of Department of Cytology and Gynecology, gy uh, gynecology Pathology, uh, PGIMER, Chandigarh and Secretary Indian Academy of Cytologists. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, welcome, ma'am. Should I uh, start sharing my screen here? Yes, ma'am. I would just like to add here that this session is being done with support of uh, Beckton Dickinson, BD. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, you have to allow me to share my screen. The host has. Paritoshi, Paritoshi, please give the rights to ma'am. Yeah. Ma'am, I have given the rights. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And I hope my screen is visible and I'm audible to all. Um, is my screen uh, visible to all? Yes. 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 Thank you very much. And uh, at the very outset, I thank the uh, ASUCHAM and the organizers uh, for having given me this opportunity to address this very august audience. And I also thank you again for giving me, uh, you know, allowing me to set the ball rolling. And uh, the topic uh, I thought that was very relevant, I stand on behalf as secretary of the Indian Academy of uh, Cytologists. And I'm also professor and head department of cytology and gynec pathology at PGI Chandigarh. And I have been very passionate about uh, screening for cervical cancer for over two and a half decades now. So cytology for cervical cancer screening, is it relevant today? Is what I'm going to talk in the next few minutes. And this is uh, like we already heard about it, the situational analysis of cervical cancer in India, which contributes uh, to nearly 29% of all the cancers amongst women, the second most common cancer after breast cancer. Nearly 1,22,844 women diagnosed with cervical cancer every year, and we are able to save only half of them, perhaps. So we, are, we have to talk about uh, the awareness for screening, which is there in, you know, just about 8 to 10% of our total population. And what is happening in India particularly is that there is no population-based screening program at all. What we really are doing is some form of opportunistic screening, again in uh, certain uh, hospitals across the country and with a very poor coverage, as you can see, barely, um, you know, 0.1% to 6.9% or so. But as has already been rightly mentioned, that if there is a single test that for any cancer, that is the pap smear, the pap test, which has served us well for over five decades, and uh, in countries where they have good screening programs, it led to a 75% reduction in cervical cancer screening with reg cases with regular screening. So that is the importance of screening. And it provides, gives the women an average of 23 years of quality of life years gained. Now we all know that these are the targets set for us by the WHO. So by 2030, this is the 90, 70, 90. And what I'm going to be focusing is the 70% screening. We have to target women and get them uh, and screen them for cervical cancer and also provide effective treatment for those women who test positive. Now, this is the current WHO recommendations uh, uh, for these is the guidelines for screening and treatment uh, that has been published. And so basically what uh, we all know that the WHO recommends HPV DNA detection as the screening modality. But the rider is that Existing programs with quality control uh, sufficiently quality control can still continue with cytology as the primary screening test until such time that DNA testing, HPV DNA testing becomes operational. So this is what I said that wherever the HPV DNA testing is not yet operational, we continue with the existing system of either VIA or cytology to provide the women some form of screening service. So what is the landscape of cervical cancer screening in India? So if you look at the nearly 48.35 crore women who are, you know, who have to be screened, 
uh, basically just about a handful of them, nearly just about 3% of them have some sort of access to any kind of screening. And the screening methodologies are via cytology and of course HPV DNA testing, all are available in India, in fact. So if you look at the uh, performance and versus cost of each of these technologies, VIA is or usually offered in many programs to the rural underprivileged women. It's very, uh, it's poor on performance, but very low on cost. And at the other end of the spectrum, you have HPV DNA testing, which is, uh, you know, available to urban privileged women, which is excellent on performance, the recommended test today, but still has a prohibitively high cost. And cytology comes in the middle, both as well as performance and as well as cost go, and it is currently available in India. Now, when I talk of cytology, we have moved from conventional to liquid-based cytology, and uh, like already mentioned, uh, BD uh, and other companies had a big role to play. And uh, so this, why did we switch over to liquid-based cytology? Is simply, you see, compare the smears there and compare the screening area here. So you have, it gave us a much very low unsatisfactory rate, it gave us a clean background, small area to screen, less time, and residual material was also available for HPV testing. Now, if you look at the key elements of cytology-based screening programs in India, so this is uh, uh, the Indian Academy of Cytologists has been conducting regular workshops, CMEs on pap smear interpretation. We also have an annual examination for cytotechnicians and cytotechnologists and approximately approximately 10, only 10, uh, uh, you know, pass this exam. So they're qualified a pool of cytotechnicians and cytotechnologists, all of which keep in mind can be upscaled. We've been running an external quality assurance programs in, uh, uh, on behalf of IAC since the year 2000. I was the chairperson of this EQUAS program until very recently. And we have an increasing participation with every year. We started off with 80 labs and currently we have uh, more than 130 laboratories across the country which participate in our EQUAS program. Of course, it all this can be uh, needs further upscaling. And I'm very happy and Dr. Shalini Singh probably is addressing this. Uh, we have an ICPR which is recently uh, going to start the online training course for pathologists which has been successfully launched. What about access to cytology? Now it's available, like I said, in most medical colleges and teaching institutes across the country, available in a lot of uh, multi-speciality hospitals in the private sector and also in standalone laboratories. And like I said, uh, LBC has penetrated the country uh, to a large extent. Now, the advantages of this, all these uh, is that it allows for full automation and even semi-automation and savings of great uh, savings in time and manpower can handle large volumes. So currently we are, you know, utilizing uh, the uh, underutilizing the available LBC resources also, in my opinion. Remember that cytology detects the disease rather than just the infection. And of course, newer solutions like the direct to slide solutions by BD are also coming in. I haven't uh, had much experience because it's only recently launched, but there are again uh, uh, solutions which can be upscaled. Uh, this is the system that we have in PGI. This is the Totalis multiprocessor, which can do 432 samples. And this is the slide prep. So anywhere between three to 300 to 400 samples they can easily be taken up in these uh, large volume uh, solutions that are there. Faster turnaround time, decreased uh, dependency, and uh, they also provide high throughput. So this is the PGI experience uh, I want to share with you that uh, we have been providing this opportunistic screening program since the 1970s. Every woman who walks into our OPD, gynae OPD, gets a pap smear test. We've uh, introduced the uh, Shiopath, uh, BD Shiopath LBC for the last 10 years. And in the year 2019, that's just before COVID came, we were uh, our annual screening was 18,000 uh, smears were screened in, in that particular year. Uh, with capacity to even upscale it. The TAT was 72 hours. And of course, it was subsidized. The cost uh, to the woman for this LBC test was subsidized by our administration, and we only charge 100 rupees. So what I, what I want to uh, tell conclude is uh, that we need to create efficient systems for the present and the future. And I'd like to propose to the industry this hub and spoke model that the hub is a ter tertiary care center, which can be utilized for having these uh, high volume, high throughput systems uh, for processing of samples, uh, irrespective of the screening test, whether it's HPV or it's cytology. You have collection centers across the country 
Uh, and then you have efficient sample tr transportation networks. Uh, we can do a decentralized reporting to ensure quick tag. Online availability can be there. We can have quality assurance systems, all of which can be done through digital uh, solutions nowadays, so that there is an efficient use of all the resources that are even currently available to us. So if you ask me, I set out with the question whether cytology for cervical screening, is it relevant today in India? The answer is yes. As a primary screening test, till such time that HPV testing facilities are available and affordable by the women of our country. And secondly, yes, again, as a triage, when HPV DNA testing becomes the primary screening modality, it would be a very good idea not to throw away cytology, but to retain it as a triage. Uh, so this is the disclaimer, and I thank you all for giving me this opportunity to address you, and th it's over to you. Thank you so much. I'm open to questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Radhika. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we'll take up questions at the end of the session. And uh, thank you so much for the uh, interesting. Dika, Dr. Rajesh Keshri, can I ask questions? Yes, yes. Uh, Dr. Abhishek, I would. I have to leave now. If I can just give my address, and I would like to leave because I have okay. an emergency. Yeah, yeah, sure, ma'am, sure. Thank you. Hello. So. Uh, uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Now I'd like to invite uh, Dr. S. Shanta Kumari. She is the president of the Federation of Obstetric and Gynecological Societies of India, FOXI. It's one of the largest organizations of professionals. It has more than 37,000 members, professional obstet uh, obstetricians and gynecologists across the length and breadth of the country. So we are indeed uh, honored to have you here. Over to you, Dr. S. Shanta Kumari, ma'am. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for those kind words, uh, Dr. Rajesh and everyone here. I bring greetings from Foxy, a 38,000 strong ob body from India. Uh, this is a very important program which you're doing because I think, unfortunately, 75 years down the lane, we are still talking about how we can prevent cervical cancer. I'm very proud of my 38,000 members, gynecologists, but uh, it is very sad that we still could not eradicate or reduce the incidence of cervical cancer in our country if if we have taken it on to us to see that we do a speculum examination for every woman at every visit if we do an screening for uh, cervical cancer i'm sure as dr radhika has told that we would have reduced the burden so i think we'll have to see now how is it that we are going to take care of our women foxy for all always has been the motto with dhira no to violence against women for this year, the vision and mission of Foxy. And we uh, actually are working towards doing our best now for cervical cancer Mukta Bharat. I think the most important message which I would like to give to my members and everyone is at every possible opportunity when a woman walks into any ob chamber, make it mandatory to do a speculum examination and do a screening. I think that should be the motto of everyone and all the patients, all the public. I think we have to start the awareness that they need to also understand because, you know, the, the uh, focus is shifting from a physical examination to an ultrasound. So patients, public, everyone feel if they have an ultrasound pelvis, they, they are very satisfied. But I, so I think we need to do more awareness. Screening is very important, both from the doctor point of view and the woman centered point of view, I think. So I really appreciate this program when you are trying to bring this important focus into the public. And I think every one of us with the FOXI, the WHO, the government of India, FIGO, I, I, I am the treasurer of FIGO also. So FIGO is a global voice of women and we are focusing our best try to reduce the burden of CS cervix globally. And unfortunately, India is contributing a huge chunk. Right? Radhika is very rightly, it's 90, 70, 90 is the motto. Now, with the COVID pandemic, we know that uh, vaccination has come to be accepted. So this is the right time where we actually can focus on trying to get all our adolescent girls vaccinated. And of course, the young mothers who come with their girls to the clinic also to motivate them for uh, vaccination. And this will go in a to a long way where we can reduce the burden of CS cervix. I think these are very important aspects where collectively we can try to do something because now the government is focused, everyone is focused. Now is the right time and we should do every possible thing 
to reduce the burden of CA service. I really appreciate all of you for uh, bringing all the stakeholders onto one platform. And as Radhika rightly put, yes, people are not very lucky. Unfortunately, there are many chambers where we still do the, only the conventional craft mirror, not even the liquid. But then VIA and all, see, at least something is being done. But I think slowly we need to shift to what is the better aspect, better way of screening. And with the government support, with everyone's support, we should be able to make a difference. So let's hope that very soon we'll be able to end this burden of uh, cervical cancer in our women and take care of their health. So thank you very much uh, for inviting me and ha having me with you all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Shanta Kumari. I think you very rightly mentioned that we should make the best use of, use of technology. And unfortunately, what is happening now is that there's a disconnect between the patients and there's more reliance on technology between the patients, either be it physicians or gynecologists. So thank you so much for your very interesting views and kind words. Thank you so much. Now I'd like to invite Ms. Mridu Gupta. She is the Chief Executive Officer of CAPIT, that is Cancer Awareness Prevention and Early Detection Trust. And they're doing a lot for uh, for the awareness of cancers and especially in the field of cervical cancer. So over to you, Ms. Mridu. Thank you, Dr. Rajesh. Thank you so much. And thank you, Asuchang, for having us here. It is a lovely opportunity for us to be able to give you all a grassroots perspective of what, how we see the disease and what we believe can be done for us to help eliminate cervical cancer. So thank you. I will not be presenting. Sorry, did somebody say something? Am I? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you, ma'am. Go ahead with your presentation. Right. So I lead CAPID, that is Cancer Awareness Prevention and Early Detection Trust. We are a grassroots organization working in the healthcare domain for the last eight years or so. Our core area of work is cervical cancer prevention and early detection. We achieve this through community outreach, awareness, and facilitating cervical cancer screening for women from the economically weaker sections of the society. So far, we have impacted 28 million people through awareness drives and screened over 14 and a half thousand women across 218 villages. All of us here know the stats on cervical cancer. We've just been told them to say that it is the fourth most common cancer in the world somehow dilutes the health emergency that yeah. cervical cancer is in our own country. In India, cervical cancer is the second most common cancer in women. Yes. But we lose more women to cervical cancer than to any other cancer. We lose one woman every eight minutes, the data says, and that to a cancer that can easily be avoided. Cervical cancer is 100% preventable. Even one life is one too many for this cancer. WHO's SDG goal for 2030 is cervical cancer elimination in high income countries. Australia says they will be cervical cancer free by 2025. But get this, WHO estimates that India will be cervical cancer free by 2110. That's 90 years from now. 90 years. That's 90 years more of losing life needlessly. We are not talking about the burden on healthcare facilities and funds that could be used on unavoidable cancers. So while the WHO's global strategy is 90% of girls should be vaccinated for HPV by the age of 16, 70% women over the age of 30 should be screened for HPV, and 90% of women with abnormal results should have access and availability to treatment, we fall short on all of these parameters, and it is to be expected since we are a low to middle income country and we have a lot of basic diseases that we are still dealing with, like TB and polio, and now, of course, with COVID. But that is not to say that we necessarily have to wait 90 years to eliminate cervical cancer. We can do it in less, much less. If we focused on prevention and eliminated hurdles to prevention. In our country, preventive health care is hugely neglected. And for cervical cancer, the neglect comes primarily from lack of awareness and poor access and availability to preventive care. We did a survey in India called Understanding Cervical Cancer Awareness in India. It covered 21 states, men and women from urban and rural areas. We had seen that 55% of people who participated had never heard of cervical cancer. And those who claimed to know about cervical cancer, 22% of them confused it with the disease of the neck. 
the cervical. So that is the lack of knowledge on cervical cancer. So if it is something you don't even know about, you cannot do anything about it. You cannot go and get a screening done because you've never heard about cervical cancer. When we do corporate workshops also, we are in a room of educated and aware women, knowledgeable people. In a room of about 100 people, we have an average of five women who've heard of cervical cancer. And even that, not in totality. So this in India is not a problem of educated or non-educated. It is not a problem of urban or rural. We have seen it across the strata of society. We are just not aware. The lack of conversation and information on cervical cancer in India is appalling. Communicating information in a manner that can lead to conversation and discussions around cervical cancer and its prevention is a core pillar of what we do at CAPIT. It is the basis of starting the elimination for cervical cancer. And awareness does make a difference. When we create awareness in a village and then hold a screening camp, we get a lot more women than when we go in with the government and just do a screening camp. We barely get 10, 15 women. When we create awareness, we do more than 125 screenings in a day. That's the difference awareness makes. When we do awareness camps at corporates and, and schools and colleges, the number of women who come for a health pledge day is a lot more. It's a 30% increase in numbers after an awareness camp. So awareness works. And yet, awareness is only part of it. I mean, we've seen it with COVID, right? People are aware of what kind of a problem it is. They are aware of the disease and they are aware of the gravity of the disease also. But how many of them would wear a mask if there was no mandate or a chalan? And how many of them don't wear a mask even though it, there is a mandate for it? Right? So even though we are aware, we do not reach out for preventive health. We do not take, take advantage of the prevention. In our survey on cervical cancer awareness, we learned that 73% of women have neither gotten a screening or a vaccination done despite being correctly aware of cervical cancer. So I know what it can do to me. I know it can save my life, but I'm not doing anything about it. And there are many reasons for it that we found in our survey. We don't have the time to go into it, but the yes. primary reason is access and availability to preventive care, either for vaccines in urban India. The fact that in rural India, when we went in and started creating awareness, we realized that we were needlessly creating fear because the women could go nowhere to be screened. The closest point would be many kilometers away for them. That is when we started a mobile screening van in villages. Now we work with district governments through their NCD program to create sustainable screening processes because cervical cancer is part of the NCD project. So there are many other points that come up in the field as ground realities, but awareness, and access remain the two large factors. Currently, India has no cohesive strategy for elimination of cervical cancer. And the resources that do exist are scattered and they're being conducted in silos, including all of us who are working at grassroots level. It is time we all came together to create a conversation, strategies and solutions for a cohesive fight against cervical cancer. There is no other way we can fight this completely preventable disease. We have been looking at large organizations like ASOCHAM and CII to create a national forum for the elimination of cervical cancer and then work through our the state chapters to be able to implement something like that. And, you know, every January, there's so much of talk around cervical cancer that I'm very hopeful we are going to definitely create something. But 4th of Feb, World Cancer Day, and after that, everything just kind of dies away. So I'm hoping very soon we can do something and we can find a conclusive solution to cervical cancer elimination in our country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Prithu Gupta. I think uh, this address was very important and I'm sure SOHM would take up the initiative that you have just talked about because a lot needs to be done. The 90 year goal is should not be uh, should not be acceptable to our country thank you so much Absolutely. we'll uh, definitely take this up uh, forward uh, now i request thank you ma'am uh, now i request uh, dr abhishek shankar he is the associate professor department of radiation oncology aims patna associate editor epjcp and associate editor sajc and uh, 
he's the founder and secretary of uh, an organization ISCO. So I'd request uh, you to address the August gathering, Dr. Abhishek. Thank you, Dr. Rajesh. And in reply to the Madam Gupta has uh, said that there is no, uh, you know, uh, plan for eliminate cervical cancer by Government of India. Government of India has two programs for that, NPCDCS, which is happening long ago. And now in 2016, Government of India started a framework for screening of common cancers in India. And we all know it is very, very difficult to screen and to convince people for a screening in cancer. And our problem is that, as he rightly pointed out, I'm still feeling that by 10th of February, we will eliminate cancer, you know, from India by seeing the enthusiasm of people around the country when they are inviting for lectures. Everybody is just, <clears throat> and even last day of January, nobody wants to take, you know, leave a chance of making people aware about cervical cancer. I'm so happy that now you people have started talking about cervical cancer. Otherwise, you know, it was the era of, if you talk about awareness, everybody will tell you awareness should be related to breast cancer until and unless prove otherwise. It was seen in few years back, I see in January, I see people are just celebrating breast cancer awareness. So now the thing has changed and probably surgeon, I will give credit to surgeon of this country who has really worked so hard that now people have fairly good idea about breast cancer, their symptoms. And one important thing is you just see the comparison of the socioeconomic strata of the patient who for the cervical cancer or the breast cancer, you will come to know, which is more glamorous. So cervical cancer is primarily a disease of the lower socioeconomic strata. So who will fight for them? Have I, anybody has come across about the cervical cancer survivorship group, any group which talks about cervical cancer survivorship. And I don't think it will happen because, you know, they are poor people. If they come here for treatment, they just, you know, waste their one day of uh, whatever they earn. So it is very difficult for them. So breast cancer is a glamorous disease. And, you know, you ask Angelina Jolie, break BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene. People who are from the non-scientific background correlate more with the Angelina Jolie than the breast cancer. So this is power of health education. And we must try to adapt and COVID-19 has really taught us how to make people aware. Do you think cervix is easy to pronounce? You know, this, uh, the vaccine, whatever the Serum Institute and the other, they are, have a fairly good idea what America is vaccinating to their people, what UK is vaccinating. They are well versed even with the trial of, you know, uh, the COVID-19. So cervical cancer needs such kind of attention. Right now, whatever we are doing is a moonshot, but India needs a ground shot approach, which is very, very difficult. And for a community-based approaches, you need multiple years to get a, you know, short-term gain. So who is ready to invest 20 or 30 years? So it's an announcement by WHO. People remember this, people try to do something, but for a community-based cancer screening, it is so, so difficult. And we need to, you know, make a good strategy in this country has shown us with the polio example, we don't have a marketing approach for cervical cancer awareness because nobody's interested. And I, I simply think that this is a social structure because we are hardly worried about what is happening to the poor people. If, and there is no, I think for overall cancer, there are so many brand ambassadors for Pan Masala. You will see one or the other person is coming on the front page of, have you seen anybody coming on the front page and requesting people to go for vaccination, requesting people to go for, you know, cervical cancer screening? It is not possible. And Government of India has adopted visual inspection with acetic acid, which is a very simple test. And the moment you do it, you get the result. And we are having a tough time to implement it. Already it is in 616 districts out of 748 districts in the country, but with a very limited success. Now we have included with the other NCDs like diabetes, mellitus, <clears throat> and hypertension. So when you see the total number of screen cases, it is all reflected majority by the diabetes and hypertension because it is very easy for them to screen. 
it is a very tough task for us to achieve whatever goals who has said which is already discussed by many people 90 70 and 90 you know you dr rajes and shm you do one thing you just make a short survey and circulate among your people about you know cervical cancer that how many people of them has gone for screening who are eligible in their family and how many of them has vaccinated their child you will come to know what is the success among us so this is we we talk you know if we take responsibility to vaccinate and to ensure screening of people at their workplace we don't have to do you know anything we we will you know screen and there is nothing 100% you can't achieve anything in this country where there is so much of social diversity i am not a person who will tell somebody who is not getting a food to eat twice a day i will not tell tell them and request them to go for a screening and vaccinate their child you know if they get food to eat twice a day that will be the best thing for them because i don't think cervical cancer is the only problem in the society i think if they you know there are many others but yes being a doctor we can do much and you know problem is that we are worried whatever we can do and whatever we can achieve we are not getting achieve at this and cervical cancer is a prim- table cancer this is a well known fact if you know if it is caused by hpv if you are infected it takes years and years to develop into a cancer so you have 10 to 15 years in between to intervene and to stop the progress of the disease so this you know as a country we are very fortunate that we are almost 70% of the cancer which are preventable but for the prevention you need a bigger approach you know better approach you had need a good leadership and it should be a passionate one i don't think cervical cancer elimination whatever the goal less than 4 per 100000 is not possible in this country there is a place called sick sikkim you know they have vaccinated 100% of their eligible population 9 to 14 years of age this is just about the bell power they started and they have done it you think about it. and you know many of the people talked about the vaccination do you know there are two manufacturer who makes vaccine in this country supply that and one company has a stop giving supply to the country right now the one is gsk and the reason is they don't have the stock do you think we are talking about cervical cancer elimination and one of the important component which is a vaccine uh, to the children and we don't have the vaccine which is supplied to us this is a lots of problem so many people have ask me where we can procure the vaccine and vaccine cost is an important issue now for the last many years it was 1500 over the counter now this has gone up to 2300 so if and many of the government through gabi and through the paho they have decreased the cost to the 8 dollar i think rotary has taken a big step you know to vaccinate almost uh, 100000 uh, young girl that is the best step but for this i will stick only to the awareness part and i will not advise any other organization to go for screening part and in analysis you have a institutional backup to support their treatment if somebody is screen positive this is a very very critical issue very ethical dilemma if you go for screening is very very easy for any subside but the moment somebody is positive the questions come who will take the responsibility of treatment of those who are screen positive being in you know serving in all indian institute of medical sciences we can treat 5 10 15 patient but if 100 screen positive patient comes to us it is a very very difficult task for us even to cater treatment to all of them so we should make people aware and madam has rightly pointed out two three women i have come across who has taken cervical cancer vaccine and they came to me and they told me that okay i have now taken cervical vaccine probably i will never have neck pain in the future so still people yes, are relating you. cervical to the cervical neck it's yes, not sir. so you think thank you know how much difficulty we have we are unable to locate an organ where it is and we are talking so probably for next 10 years if we try to shot the ground probably we can achieve the goal but probably with yeah. the moon shot approach and interesting fact about cervical cancer it has really got a good opportunity it, you know to present themselves in the powerpoint presentation very fancy you know in next 20 30 21 10 
So this is all not going to, and probably this is not much worry about the institution where I will still prefer that people who comes to an institution, we should tell them the ideal practices by which they can get the maximum advantage. Suppose I thank talk you, about. China. Thank you, Dr. Abhishek. Uh, it was really very interesting and very informative. You've touched upon the different aspects of prevention. And, and obviously, we are, we are now doing, some, you know, planning to do a big campaign with WHO and probably that will short the ground. That will. So, so that we'll have the representative of WHO and we'll listen uh, from them also how they're going about it. Now I'd request Dr. Shalini Singh. She is the director ICMR National Institute of Cancer Prevention and Research. Uh, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India, who so kindly consented to be with us. Uh, I would uh, request you to uh, give your views about cervical cancer prevention and awareness and what the government is doing about it. Madam. Yes, uh, thank you and Namaskar to everybody and a very good morning to all of you. I'd like to compliment uh, the organizers as a chairman for arranging this program in the month of cervical cancer awareness. And let me begin uh, by saying that this August gathering does not uh, need you, uh, to know anything about cervical cancer. But however, we are the people who need to convey this to a lot of other people who uh, you know, are devoid of uh, healthcare facilities and who need to know about cervical cancer. And it is because we are still talking about it because somewhere we know that we have not been able to spread the message, our knowledge, in our own surroundings, because as everybody had said, it is the second most uh, commonest cancer in our country. And unlike many other cancers, it is totally preventable cancer. And this cancer occurs in the uh, prime of a woman's life. But if detected early, again, it's totally curable. But uh, however, the women who are not able to access uh, reproductive health care go on to develop this painful, it's very painful. And when diagnosed in advanced stages, the disease has poor survival and poor quality of life. Everybody almost abandons the woman because of fistulas and so many other problems. So otherwise, cervical uh, cancer is a disease which has a fairly long period of a phase, which is called a pre-cancer phase, and during which it can be easily detected and also cured. So as uh, we all know that uh, WHO has recently uh, called for a use of a very effective screening method, the HPV DNA test as a primary screening tool at the population level. But it, this is a long goal for us to achieve. And as uh, other speakers also pointed out that the uh, cytology and the BIA also still remain as the tool still uh, we can uh, afford this uh, expensive test. <clears throat> and if only two consecutive times the WHO says that uh, uh, this test is done at five years intervals between the ages of 30 to 49 years, and it turns out to be negative, then one can be rest assured for from you know being free from cervical cancer. So, but all these methods they do need uh, manpower, trained manpower, and machines. So, at the National Institute of Cancer Prevention and Research, we run online. Uh, and hands-on uh, training programs for our gynecologists, the medical officers, the nurses, and the ASHA workers working both in public and in private sector. And we have trained about more than 3,000 staff. We had also uh, contributed to the development of the operational guidelines for cancer screening and early uh, detection and management. And this is what we are uh, you know, training everybody for. We also have, uh, we also recognized a colposcopy center. So uh, gyne we gynecologists come to our center for getting trained in colposcopy for about uh, eight weeks uh, in a row. Then uh, we've also done a lot of demonstration projects uh, in the public sector as well as in the NGOs and to understand what are the challenges that the government is going to face in operationalizing of these uh, screening methods. So uh, all these things we publish, and of course, we also uh, work along with CAPED to reach the grassroots levels. And as uh, Ridhu pointed out, that it is very, very important to be aware. So the other strategy which uh, is most important for cervical cancer prevention is the vaccination. And it is one of the few cancers which has a direct causative agent, and the vaccine has also been developed. 
And some countries, uh, example like Sweden and Australia, who introduced the nationwide uh, vaccination for teenage girls in 2007, and they have found that there's 90% reduction in the incidence of cervical cancer in 2020. So it takes a little longish time when the results of their decision of the policymakers will bear fruit. And so from this uh, platform, I would say that the policymakers need to think about the lag time which is involved in uh, ha ha cervical cancer prevention. And uh, so as uh, already pointed out that it will take us a long time to be able to reach the WHO target. And to illustrate, uh, as everybody else has also said, I had also, uh, you know, faced a similar situation where I'd like to uh, narrate an anecdote when a lady who's running a not-for-profit organization for women's issues uh, visited me in office and saying that she wanted to work on cervical cancer and she was very keen. Um, it was a hot summer day and I just quickly asked her to, yes, uh, you know, what do you want to do? But clearly she had no idea where the cervix was and she kept pointing to the back of the neck and saying, you know, she wanted to help out women. So that is the level of awareness. And uh, also that, uh, you know, I feel that awareness and knowledge is actually the percept which changes our perception or the situation or the fact, and that's it's the most important. You know, it gives us the power, which gives us the, uh, this makes us uh, decide and things move on with things which will influence our outcomes. So it helps us to make better decision makers. It gives us the self-confidence so that we can communicate with clarity and it allows us to understand things from multiple perspectives. So knowledge really frees us from our assumption and biases and myths which are circulating around uh, cervical cancer. So all these need to be clarified in these awareness programs. So ideally, women should know what is cervical cancer, how does it happen, in which age group it happens, who are at risk, is there a prevention strategy or a cure or a treatment, and where can I seek it, am I at risk, and then if somebody around me has, uh, you know, some this kind of a problem, or my family, then where can I go and seek help? And then finally, everybody should contribute, you know, towards this uh, goal of cervical cancer reduction in the community. From the community side, there should be a demand, I feel, for uh, vaccination, for testing, from screening. Because uh, as also pointed out by the earlier speakers, you know, a lot of papers have been published where they have tested the knowledge of college students. And only 5 to 10 percent have partial knowledge. They do not understand what factors actually increase their risk of uh, cervical cancer, like smoking, having multiple sex partners, cervical infections, or early onset of sexual intercourse, multiple pregnancies, and so on and so forth. And so uh, what happens is for a simple discharge, vaginal discharge, women will end up with hysterectomy. So the mothers and the parents also need to understand, you know, what uh, are the, um, uh, what, what, the, how should they uh, impart this knowledge to their offsprings and daughters to be able to protect them from cervical cancer? Thank but the you. mothers do not feel competent to be able to hand over this information. So they feel it should be done through school curricula. So yes. I think that in summary, the government should roll out awareness programs, counseling programs, and health education programs right in schools and colleges, which will demand, uh, make a demand for screening, vaccination, and testing. And the industry should support in development of affordable vaccines and methods. So thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Shalini Singh. I think and it was indeed very heartening to know about the programs that your institute is conducting for uh, the doctors and for the technicians and uh, for all that you're doing for increasing awareness and treatment and screening of cervical cancer. Now, there's been a lot of discussion about the diagnostics, about the HPV diagnostics, uh, the next speaker that we are going to have with us uh, going to enlighten us, is from Roche, which is the world's largest biotech company, the Roche Diagnostics India Private Limited. It was established in 2002 and has a broad range of innovative diagnostic tests and systems. So I would like uh, to invite Mr. Narendra Vardhi. He is the Managing Director, India and Neighboring Markets, Roche Diagnostics India Private Limited. Mr. Vardhi, Managing Director for Roche Diagnostics India. Uh, is a competent leader with a diversified and deep knowledge of healthcare industry with a total of 16 years of experience in microfinance, IVD, medical devices, pharmaceuticals, and uh, diagnostic industries. 
So over to you for your address, Mr. Narendra Varde, the Managing Director, India and Neighboring Markets, Suraj Diagnostics. Thank you, Dr. Rajesh. Good afternoon, everyone. Good uh, afternoon. Thank you, Chin, for putting this event together. And uh, it's really a privilege to be part of such an accomplished uh, panelist over here. Uh, the first thing which came to my mind is everyone here spoke with so much passion that uh, everything that I had over here, I'm going to just not going to speak about it because uh, everyone spoke about so many statistics and experience. So I'm going to be more extempo in terms of what I want to share. Uh, in a lot of the statistics that were shared on um, cervical cancer prevention elimination, I think there are two which I still want to point out. While we know that cervical cancer is the second largest cause of uh, occurrence and mortality in India, uh, it also contributes to the world's uh, 25%. So one fourth of the world's uh, cervical cancer mortality also comes from India. That's important to note. The second point is when we looked at the data from 2018 to 2020, the number of cases of cervical cancer and mortality rates have increased in the range of 27 to 30%. Now, both of these are huge numbers to ponder on, and that's where there is really a need to think about what do we do, how do we do in steps to prevent this cancer. All of us have seen a family member, have seen a friend who's gone through cancer, and it's a it's a painful process, not just cervical cancer, but any cancer is a painful process. What an individual goes through is, is torturous, but beyond that, what the family goes through, the burden on the entire health infrastructure that it causes is significant. And this is something we, we really need to take cognizance of. When it comes to cervical cancer, again, this is one of the most painful cancers which are there. But the relief here is that it is preventable, right? It can be prevented through a proper vaccine and testing strategy, which is not the case with many other cancer types. And that's where I think we need to put a lot more focus on what is it that we can do. We spoke about the WHO mandate, the 70, 90, 70 rule over there, where yes, there needs to be a lot of focus on vaccination, um, and there is an age limit on, you know, the girls who can get vaccinated, but then they also recommend the HPV test as the screening test over here. Um, and, and the reason and the reason they do that, and I'll refer to last year's IFCPC satellite meeting that happened in India. Um, it was uh, again attended by the who's who a lot of strong representatives from Foxy were over there as well. And in that consensus document that that came out they very strongly recommended that we need to go with the HPV testing because the sensitivity is more than 90%. Pap smear, we are, while they have done a lot of job in, you know, in so many years, they were launched five decades back. And in this process right now, a lot of technological advancements have been made. Their sensitivity is still around 50%, whereas HPV testing, the sensitivity has gone more than 90%. The question definitely comes about making it more affordable and the cost. And one of the things we spoke about is also looking at the total cost aspect of it, because the frequency with which you need to do a pap smear and a VR test is probably every three years. Whereas WHO recommends for a HPV test, ideally you do it at the age of 35, you repeat it between the age of 45 and 50, and that's it. And if you get a negative test, it, it almost means you are cervical cancer free, right? Uh, so when you are looking at doing a screening program and that too for a large population country like India, if you are going to do devise a program where you need to test women every three years uh, or, and at that frequency, then again, it puts in a lot of resources, makes the program very complex, also costly, versus a program that is designed where you are doing it probably twice in the lifetime of an individual. So you probably then don't look at the cost per test. You look at it from a total program cost, from a total uh, burden. Here I'm not even referring to the costs that go in when someone is not detected, when someone is detected positive, 
then the amount of costs that go in terms of uh, healthcare expenditure, getting a bed, surgeon fees, all, all those expenses are still another costing which, which, we are, which we don't take into account. And the one which has no cost to it, you know, the quality of life of a person, of an individual, that, that also is important. Awareness is something, and I think Dr. Mridu Gupta, you, you put it out so well out there in terms of awareness. Uh, so this is a cervical cancer month. At Roche, we said, you know, it starts at home, right? We need to do it first. So we've launched, uh, we've launched a program where we are giving a cervical cancer screening on the HPV testing to every employee or their family member. And we're creating this awareness with them. And it's, it's really something that we want to check over the next two months, how many people really come forward because now we have created this awareness. There are internal emailers going on. It's completely free of cost, but now we want even, even the gynac fees and consulting is, is taken care of. And now we really want to come back and check how, what percentage of women people actually take advantage of it. Right. And that's, that's, that's going to be something we want to see. Again, Prime Minister Narendra Modi ji, his vision is to eliminate cervical cancer before 2030, right? And the the other um, numbers that I heard was probably it's the next century altogether. So uh, in, in that case, I guess what we see is being from the industries, there is an existing infrastructure that has been created in the country because of COVID. So now PCR technology is something which is a known technology to every household as well. And, and uh, doctors know it. So there are, there are a lot of instruments across the country that have the PCR technology there. And that's where the HPV testing can be done. So if, if, we, if we don't work in silos and if we look at the infrastructure that the government has built, and don't look at it as a department of say COVID versus hepatitis and cervical cancer and rather see on how do we use the infrastructure. We actually have very high throughput instruments in AIMS and the who's who, the SMS Jaipur and, you know, really, really top uh, institutes across the country where this infrastructure can be used and these uh, uh, programs can be set up, uh, can be done. I also feel uh, we need to create a lot of awareness with corporates. There are a lot of corporates who are doing CSR activities. How do we get funds from them and pull them into this and also give them the confidence that, you know, where they're investing, there is a steering committee who is actually investing this for the right cause, publishing a report of where the money has gone in. Uh, and, um, in the private sector, I think the companies also need to be aware. The people and culture people, the HR people uh, probably need to use this as one of the parts of their wellness program towards, uh, you know, helping uh, women uh, with, a, with a cervical cancer free life. And uh, that's, that's also another area where I see that more and yes. more corporates, private institutions can also take this up and do this for the women. Let's not expect the government yes. to do it for everyone. There is a population that can afford it, that can pay out of pocket. There are companies who can do it for the employees. And then the government does it for the people who need it the most, who cannot pay it out of the pocket. So a lot we... of strategies can be implemented if we all work together. Thank and you. Thank that, you. I'll end my note, Dr. Rajesh. Thank you so much. And I would just like to add here that SOHM definitely is going to pitch in and we are going to take up this issue. And probably we are going to come up with programs about spreading awareness and about uh, screening and taking this forward. And definitely, I think the, the, the target should be 2030 and not 2019. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Narendra. Uh, one clarification here. About I'd like really to, uh, sir, can we take the questions and comments at the end? Because we are already running behind the schedule. I know, so but you know, I just wanted to say now there is a report that VIA is now, you know, reducing the mortality related to cervical cancer. This report has been published. So as a government of India screening guideline, this is a visual inspection of facetic acid, which is recommended to be done between 30 to 65 years of age. The frequency is five years. And now this helps to reduce the mortality related to cervical cancer. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, uh, for that uh, note and for that addition.
now we are coming to one of the most important parts uh, of uh, our our program today now we'll request uh, dr princess notemba nono similela she is the assistant director general and special advisor for strategic priorities world health organization to deliver the keynote address dr princess notemba uh, nono similela i would uh, we are so honored to have you here with us i would once again like to welcome you and i would like to hand over the podium to you for your keynote address madam thank you rajesh thank you very much i'd like to also thank the organizers uh, for inviting the would you be a bit louder ma'am we can't hear you properly please be a bit louder yes okay. I was just saying that I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting WHO to participate in this very lively discussion about how we are going to actually do what we've asked the world to do, and that is to eliminate cervical cancer. I think we need to recognize that we are where we are because of what I've called so global health complacency. We forgot about cervical cancer. And when we did that, uh, the numbers kept going up, which is why to eliminate cervical cancer is going to take us a century. If we are the, are the, are the generation that will also give up, then we are not leaving anything or any option for the oncoming generations to take this challenge on. The important points that I had this morning, uh, it's morning time, this end, is the fact that we've got a preventable cancer. We've got a vaccine that can prevent this cancer. And we've also got tools that can screen women and women can be treated for the pre-cancer lesions. And if they've got invasive cancer and is found early, diagnosed early, we still have a chance. So this is a cancer that gives us a long time lag for us to identify it and to deal with. So there are many opportunities, and I'd like to encourage us to be optimistic, because if we lose faith before we start, then we are not going to be able to do even the smallest thing that is possible. Uh, sorry for interrupting, ma'am. Can I request you to be a bit louder so that we can hear you much better? A bit louder, maybe you can bring the microphone close to your mouth. How is it now? It's a bit better, but uh, even if, if it's a bit louder, it would be much better, ma'am. Maybe okay. you can just much come closer a bit closer. This. Yes, yes, now we can hear you. Okay, thank you. So, how did we arrive at this point? This call to elimination by the Director General was based on the facts that I've just spoken about, that we've got a preventable cancer, got a potentially curable cancer. The world has the tools, but those tools are not reaching everybody. If you look at the map that we've got there, you can see that Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, and many other countries in South America have very high incidence of cervical cancer. The countries that have minimal disease are the ones that are actually accessing the tools that I'm referring to, that you also have spoken about. The vaccine, we, we are told, is not available, but the vaccine is being sold at very high prices in high-income countries, which means there is a focus also on profit. There isn't that solidarity that is required to support low-income and low-middle-income countries to access 
this vaccine. If you go through the Gavi Alliance, pay, in fact, it's $5 now. But if you were to buy it in the US, it's close to $100. So the argument here is, if that is possible through Gavi, it means that we can actually afford to pay for this if the manufacturing companies were prepared to negotiate with governments. Now, we've learned also that if we bring women to the table, women who have survived cervical cancer, have a very powerful voice of advocates that can come to the table and tackle this disease as a political problem to show that even if they had cervical cancer, they are alive today, not because they are lucky because they were able to access the tools that we have. Next slide. Yes, we got to these targets. We agree that these are stretch targets and we were prepared to challenge the world. All the member states of WHO adopted these targets, although we had thought that member states would push back and say this is not doable. So by adopting these, it means that governments are committed to do the best that they can to achieve targets. Now, not so long ago, towards the end of 2021, WHO pre-qualified a fourth vaccine. So we now have four vaccines that will increase supply that will also shape the market in terms of prices. So we're moving forward. Even in the presence of a COVID pandemic, seven countries introduced HPV vaccine into their programs last year. And there's about 12 other countries who are waiting 2022 to start giving HPV vaccines. When we come to other areas that need attention. One of our eloquent speakers referred to issues like smoking, like multiple sexual partners, like you know, unprotected sex. Those things are things we need to talk about, even if they are taboo, because they increase the risk of acquisition of high risk HPVs. So we've got to be able to talk to our children got to not leave this to the teachers. We've got to get the faith-based community to come on board and every one of us must take responsibility for these. We say it takes a village to bring up a child. We've got to go back to the cultures that we understand. Everybody is worried about the well of all children in their communities. Now, we've got New technologies don't have to stick with VI. HPV DNA has been shown to be a very, very uh, strong test to use. We are promoting that countries should use HPV DNA testing as the primary screening method. Because if you use HPV DNA testing, you are able to tell women who test negative that they don't have to come back into the system for at least a minimum of five years. So you know, you know that if you have 100 women and 30 of them test positive, those are the women you have to pay attention to. The other 70, they can leave and not come back for a while which means that your system, the health system, doesn't become over. As somebody else said earlier on, we've got the platforms now. COVID has propelled us into the innovative space, into the space where we can use these HPV tests and we can diagnose women very quickly. There's also self-sampling which deals with the issues of stigma 
Women don't want to come to be examined through a speculum. It's very uncomfortable. But they can do self-sampling at home and get those tests sent to the center laboratory to be, to be checked. So we've got many opportunities, I think, to really challenge ourselves. In the area of screening and treatment, we are currently busy, and India is one of the sites that is engaged in this implementation research where we are using AI-driven technology. By that, we use a smartphone, and you don't need a doctor. You need a nurse or a midwife or a health worker who can actually take a picture with their cell phone of the cervix, and you are able to have an app that is in that um, cell phone that can diagnose for you in 20 minutes whether there is a lesion or not. And we now have handheld devices that can be battery operated, that can be used to remove that lesion. So we are moving closer and closer to a one visit uh, idea where women can come in, be screened, and be treated at the same time. That deals with the costs of coming back, it deals with the opportunity costs for the women, and it lessens the pressure on the health system. Where we are struggling is areas where we need skills for surgical oncology because we don't have enough oncologists. We don't have the people who can do the advanced hysterectomies uh, that are required when women have advanced cervical cancer. So we are working with professional associations in the north, in the south, by looking for ways in which we can use telemedicine, telementoring, and doing anything that is possible to bring up the skills of young upcoming gynecologists to train in this area of work. And this is where we must challenge governments to say that committed also to universal health uh, coverage. What does that look like for cervical cancer? If you invest in these um, machines, if you invest in these technologies, you benefit other cancers as well. You know, the machines that we use don't just treat women with cervical cancer. You can treat a lot of other cancers across the population. So we've got to change our narrative to a positive narrative that says this is doable. It is doable. We need to make our demands or our issues political. And we do that by bringing women to demand these services from their own needs. We mustn't allow a gap between member states coming to say yes here in Geneva, going back home and not fulfilling the promises that they had made to their communities. So we've got to continue to challenge and to demand these services. Because as somebody else said earlier, it's the women and women matter in the communities. We cannot walk up like that. If treat one woman, you are actually treating the entire family. We cannot leave many of these young girls and boys as orphans uh, because we haven't managed to get to their mothers on time. We've got many other uh, technologies that are coming upstream that are going to assist us really to deal with this, uh, with this cancer. And we want allies like yourself. We want people that work with industry. We would like to invite everybody is listening, who is participating in this meeting today to not give up because giving up really is not an option for us. If you really, really are passionate about this, 
you really must stand, stand up. Understand that this is a long, long toll, but that by doing your best, when you are here as a clinician, you are leaving behind a legacy that's going to be built upon by others who will come after us. But we've got to set the foundation because we, if we don't, we will find ourselves in a worse place in 2030 than where we are today. So I want to encourage you and I want to ask you to continue to become allies in the fight and in the charge to eliminate cervical cancer and to be bold about the things that um, need to treat women. Like I say, there are many avenues to approach political leaders. As I said, you know, if you bring the women to the table, they are also going to be advocates for us. I want to leave you with um, a quotation by somebody that I'm sure you, you, you honor, you, who is our, our worldwide icon, uh, President Nelson Mandela, who said, it always seems impossible until it's done. So right now we're facing a mountain. We think we'll never climb it, but we can if we want to. Thank you very much, Rajesh, and thank you for all the people listening and for all the people in this area of cervical cancer. You are doing a good job, but we need to do more. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much for your wonderful address. And thank you for this address, which indeed has changed the narrative to a positive narrative and so many good things that you have told of so much hope. I think your address has brought on to this forum, to this platform. Thank you so much, ma'am. Once again, now I would request our guest of honor, Srimati Priyanka Chaturvedi. She's a member of parliament, Rajya Sabha to address this August gathering. Madam, over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rajesh, and thank you so much, Asacham, for inviting me on this important discussion and on this important panel with very eminent speakers who come with a lot of experience in the medical field, especially what we're discussing today, cervical cancer. Uh, I'd like to begin with thanking Dr. Uh, Similella for her uh, you know, introduction and giving a worldview about how uh, we need to tackle the important issue and health concern for every woman across the world and uh, also how it impacts Indian women, considering we uh, carry the burden of one fourth uh, of the world population, which uh, detects cervical cancer and we lose women to cervical cancer and how we need to um, improve our uh, infrastructure, our systems to ensure there is more education, there's more awareness and also awareness about the vaccination. Every year, of course, we meet in the month of January where we discuss uh, cervical cancer and we also talk about how it impacts over 3 lakh women, um, uh, unfortunately, are victims of uh, cervical cancer and how prevention can help. Uh, like I said, India carries 23% of the burden. Uh, developing countries carry 25% of the burden globally and it becomes imperative that uh, considering India reports high numbers, we unfortunately do not have a government, nationwide government sponsored scheme, which tackles this particular issue. Of course, India uh, has a lot many other issues, a lot many other priorities. Uh, and unfortunately, cervical cancer does not happen to be one of the priorities in our medical health system and our parameters. We, we look at numbers and if you look at numbers, TB, diabetes are some issues that take priority. And of course, because of the pandemic, COVID has taken much of the priority. In terms of GDP, uh, it is unfortunate reality that uh, India still uh, allocates very little percentage of its GDP towards um, health. And I think that is something which uh, most of the citizens have realized after uh, we faced the pandemic. People of the country also realize how India 
rose up to the challenge of pandemic and in terms of becoming the pharmacy of the world for COVID vaccines under the Gavi uh, agreement, India happens to be at the forefront of providing vaccines globally, understands its responsibility, understands the challenges and understands how it is important for India as a nation to set a, an example to the world. As I was uh, listening to all the speakers before me, unfortunately, firstly, my apologies uh, also that I could not hear the initial speakers because of some technical issues. But while I was uh, about to join you all, I did read one uh, very important story coming from an international magazine, which says how India is moving out of uh, you know the economic crisis that COVID, COVID induced economic crisis. And it's amongst those countries which are heading towards high development growth as compared to many other developed nations in the world. So it actually speaks about what we can, if we intend to, and if we prioritize how much of our issues we can perhaps overcome, especially where cervical cancer is concerned and women uh, health is concerned. Uh, and, uh, the unfortunate reality is also that women seek treatment only after cancer has already been advanced, making treatment sometimes prohibitively expensive for them. Uh, we've also seen how women across the country do not take part in regular screenings. This is also because of a socioeconomic challenge that the nation faces. The stigma or shame attached to pelvic examination, I think, is one of the biggest uh, drawbacks that we see. And till we do not make women understand that it is about their health and it, they, it can be prevented and they may not have to undergo a lot many challenges, treatment challenges, if they are, uh, you know, uh, diagnosed much earlier, and if they are in fine health. The other problem that I, uh, that I uh, feel is going to be a challenge, and I think could be addressed also, is uh, the HPV vaccine is not part of our universal immunization program. And Tagi has also spoken about it, and maybe we should consider bringing that in the universal immunization program and that would also, while it, um, yes, the cost would uh, impact the government's uh, burden, financial burden. However, the cost can be minimized by trying to avoid the treatment expenses as well as anything additional that comes post a woman turning positive for uh, cervical cancer. So my two points and limited points, and I'll restrict myself to that, is simply because I've heard some exceedingly good points made about it with people who've got boots on ground who are seeing the challenges in rural areas as well as in urban areas a that we have to bring a screening as a mandatory health measure for every woman whether in rural areas whether it is in urban centers like many also before me have said that awareness of this is so uh, little that even in urban centers, women don't talk about it, do not know about it, do not understand it, and do not understand the severity of it once diagnosed. So what is preventable can be prevented if awareness is created. Again, the stigma attached behind uh, pelvic uh, you know, uh, uh, screening is something that also uh, we as women and women who, have, uh, who are in positions of power should be speaking up a lot more because the stigma needs to be done away with. Uh, India cannot afford to live with such, uh, you know, I would say um, social norms or constructs, which prevents women from prioritizing their health. Last but not the least, HPV vaccine. Uh, many uh, speakers before me, I think um, uh, someone before me was speaking about, I think, I'm sorry, it was Dr. Abhishek Shankarji, who made this very valid point about vaccine availability. Considering India has become a pharma uh, destination of the world, India needs to take this lead. And I would request uh, Dr. Similella in, on this particular front. We India has been making a case for IPR waivers in, in cases, issues where uh, there is severity and there is a larger number of population which suffers due to uh, these issues. Maybe we can consider IPR waivers. This may not go down well with Roche, uh, the representative of Roche, but I think it is important that we do talk about some cases or some diseases which need to be com coming under the uh, IPR waiver uh, at uh, 
at these forums uh, when we talk about global forums. So I, I would leave it at that. And I'm uh, hoping that uh, some of these measures that we have spoken about, some of the challenges that have been spoken about would be taken into uh, consideration by Dr. Shalini Singh, who is part of uh, the health uh, ministry. And uh, she would consider uh, putting these forward. And I would also, from my end, put this forward to the health ministry. And considering we have a very proactive health minister in charge, we would see some changes coming um, in the future. And I, uh, most importantly, going down to district level and ensuring that uh, ensuring that we manage to reach out to maximum number of people, it would be helpful. So thank you so much once again for having me on this forum and looking forward to more such interactions and engagements uh, as far as women health is concerned and prioritizing women's health is concerned. Thank you. Thank you, Priyanka Ji. Thank you so much for your address. And it was it is indeed uh, uh, it was very encouraging from uh, for all of us to hear from you that you would be taking up these issues that we've discussed, and which are very high priority issues. They can they are concerning the health of our women, and you're going to take up with the concerned authorities, with the minister himself, and definitely that way we are going to achieve the goal much earlier than had been predicted earlier with the uh, by, by by the speakers. So I think we've had a very wonderful session. We have discussed all the important topics which are related to uh, the prevention and disseminating information about uh, cervical cancer. And indeed, in while dealing with any of the chronic illnesses, creating awareness is very important because I think that is the first step to uh, screening and to prevention. And so much has been discussed, and especially by uh, uh, Dr. Princess Nono about the vaccine initiative and about decreasing the cost of the vaccine because that uh, the cost of the vaccine is definitely very prohibitive for a country like India. Uh, I would uh, request uh, all of you present here to give a small message to our audience uh, as uh, as concluding remarks. Can I start with the uh, uh, Dr. Princess Nothemba, similarly, are you there, ma'am? Uh, yes, ma'am. In conclusion, would you like to give a small message to the audience? Oh, yes. Um, I want to continue to encourage the people who are in the audience to make it um, their business, uh, their day-to-day -day business to be advocates for cervical cancer. When we speak often, we speak about mortality. We say every woman, I mean, every two minutes, one woman dies from cervical cancer. I'd love to challenge us to ask ourselves, what can we do with, on cervical cancer in two minutes? In two minutes, you can give an HPV vaccine. In two minutes, you can get a woman to do a self-sampling. In 20 minutes, you can actually screen and diagnose a woman, whether you use VIA or you use the new technologies. So let us, let us twist the narrative and really look at the positive things that are possible because you know the minute you speak cancer people become depressed and then they don't want to do anything about it and then the last very last but important aspect is pay attention to the mental health aspects of this disease because it's a painful disease it's an embarrassing disease for many women isolates them so they have a lot of, ment of uh, mental health problems. Thank you, Rajesh. That's my Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. I think those were indeed very important uh, points that you underlined and your message would be very well taken all across our country by the listeners. Dr. Shalini Singh, ma'am, your message to our viewers. I'd like to say that we all need to come together, the policymakers, the medical fraternity, and the community to raise awareness, 
create demand for primary awareness and we can all together make a difference and eliminate the cervical cancer from our country. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Mr. Narendra Varde would request you to give a message. I concur with what Dr. Shalini Singh mentioned. It's, <clears throat> it's all about all of us working together, the government, the policy makers, the private sector, uh, the corporates, uh, and of course the people, all of us working together, and it's absolutely possible to uh, to make leaps in, in terms of success, achieving success, setting certain milestones and trying to achieve those, and slowly we will reach our end goal. And uh, it was uh, great to hear you, Madam Priyanka Chitarvedi ji, um, your focus uh, on this topic and what you've you've endeavored to take this forward, I think that would really help us as you know, member of the Rajya Sabha. So thank you so much for it. So thank you so much, and we'll directly come to uh, Rinka ji, and we'd request her to give a concluding message. Thank you so much once again. Uh, actually, one of the viewers and participants. Uh, uh, has put in a message saying, Ms. Priyanka Chaturvedi, it is unfortunate that as a member of parliament, you don't seem to concentrate on awareness campaign on cervical cancer. Should you not take the initiative to prevent spreading of cervical cancer in the first place? And the second from Era Upadhyay saying, panelists are requested to please elaborate existing government schemes in this direction. Uh, so I just like to mention a couple of things here. I do understand the awareness that is being created, but the unfortunate reality, as Mr. Reddy would have heard, from people across board, those in the policy making space, those in political spaces like me, those who are act actively working in NGOs and ensuring there is awareness, that still we have not achieved the level of awareness that we seek. Now, about me taking the lead, yes, I will take the lead in ensuring that our health ministry also looks into that. And uh, the last but not the least uh, about prevention that will have to come from uh, government schemes, which I elaborated about, uh, about bringing uh, the vaccine under uni universal immunization program, about making vaccines cheaper. Vaccines can be made cheaper if we have IPR waivers that we have been talking about. And last but not the least about elaborating government schemes. For some reason, I thought our minister, honorable minister would be joining us and she would be able to give you all a better understanding of it. So I'm sorry, I did not come prepared with that intention, but I'm hoping that you all all would cooperate with me and also understand that it is a challenge that we face globally and it is a challenge we face across the nation and we all need to join hands together. There's no uh, blaming anybody here because this fight and in this fight, we are all in this together. So thank you so much and let's work together and look towards a, a country which is free from cervical cancer, at least aware of the prevention that can be done. Thank you so much. Definitely, ma'am, you're absolutely right that we have to work together and we have to work together for this good cause of giving relief to our mothers, our sisters and the women of this country. Thank you so much for being us, being here, being with us and uh, giving your time. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. I'd like to request Dr. Abhishek Shankar to give a small message. I would like to request be aware, get yourself vaccinated if you are in that age group and get yourself cancer screen if you are a specific cancer screening and help others to get themselves screened and finally let's work together to minimize the disparity and inequality in access to cancer care and its outcome thank you so much thank you so much dr abhishek dr radhika would you please like to give a message to our audience You are muted, ma'am. Please unmute yourself. I have uh, unmuted. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. You are audible. You are audible. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, and again, I think I will put it uh, in just three sentences. We have the tools to fight cervical cancer. We only need the will to fight it. Like everyone said, we should join hands, have self-belief, and the last three words are, yes, we can. Definitely, yes, we can, and we will do it. With this, I come to Ms. Mridu, who's been a very outspoken advocate in fighting against cancers. Ma'am, what is going to be your final word for our audience? You are muted, ma'am. Please unmute yourself. Sorry. 
So everybody who's listening, everybody who's going to hear this later, if you are in the age group to be screened, please go and get screened. If you are in the age group to be vaccinated, be vaccinated. For all the men out there, please go home and make sure that the women in your life know about cervical cancer and they do what needs to be done. And for everybody here who feels that they can do something, start talking about it, share information and reach out and do whatever you can do. We need more advocates as Princess Imadera said. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And on behalf of SHM, I'm very thankful to all the participants, to all the eminent uh, specialists and panelists of uh, today's conference. I'm thankful to Mr. Ravi Bhatnagar, who was the, who was the co chairperson on the, of SHM CSR Council. Uh, I'm thankful to Dr. Radhika, Dr. Shanta Kumari, Ms. Mridu Gupta. Uh, Dr. Vishayak Shankar, uh, Dr. Shalini Singh, and Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Varde from from Narendra Varde from uh, Rosh and Dr. Princess Nathamba Nona Similarla. Obviously, so kind of her to have joined and enlightened us. And I'm also very thankful to Shrimati Priyanka Chaturvedi, the Honorable Member of Parliament, Rajya Sabha. Uh, thank you so much to all of you for sparing time and for being with us and for sharing so much knowledge and uh, providing our August audience information about cervical cancer, how to go ahead and how to in fact eliminate it from our country, making it pro making it the first cancer disease to be eliminated. Thank you everyone. Thank you once again and Jai Hind. Thank you. Thank you.